Um, so actually, this year the moose strikes back again, the return, <laughs> with uh, Olivier and Massara. Massara. Massara, it's your first time here, right? Yeah. So welcome. And uh, you have the floor. Thank you. All right. Welcome, and thank you for being at our presentation. Uh, today we're going to talk about attacking Linux Moose 2.0, so the version 2 of Linux Moose, and which unraveled an ego market. So we firstly wanted to present ourselves. My name is Masara paquet Clouston. I'm a researcher at GoSecure Inc., which is a Montreal-based firm um, in cybersecurity. I'm also a master's student, just finishing now my master in criminology at University of Montreal. And I'm a treasurer for the NordSec conference, which we'll talk a little bit afterwards. Yeah, so our accent is uh, Canadian French, for those who are asking. Uh, so uh, me and myself, I'm a security researcher at GoSecure. Uh, in charge of the team. I'm also doing an um, executive uh, position for the NordSec conference in CTF, and I'm going to just plug our conference quickly since it's in Montreal, and I think well, we are looking for speakers. And uh, it's a nice, nice place to be, so anyone here interested, uh, it's a non-for-profit organization. We have a conference, capture the flag, and training. Awesome people and always looking for speakers. This is a picture of our hardware badge. I actually brought an extra one with me, uh, so tomorrow if you uh, see me and you want a hardware badge, uh, I'll give it to you. So just quickly, we wanted to go over the agenda today so you have an idea of what we're going to talk about. So we've, did an, we've done a research that tried to go, sort of do a combination of technical and social analysis. So we'll firstly go on a quick Linux Moose recap, so be really, uh, like listen, because it, really, it goes really quickly. Then Olivier will explain how he built the Honeypots environment for analysis and how uh, we conducted the man in the middle attack on the botnet. Once we did that, we accessed the decrypted traffic. So we'll, we sort of have a large conclusion of the whole analysis that we did over five characteristics in which uh, we explain Linux Moose clever scheme. So we'll go over those five characteristics. And quickly, this is a joint research, and it's a good example of how we can do research that both is social and technical, but as well, it's corporate and uh, academic. So uh, it's both CoSecure, ESET, and University of Montreal that uh, participated in the research. So I'll leave the floor for Olivier in the next 20 minutes. All right, so Linux Moose, we uh, had the fancy pictures of, uh, of the Moose last year. So in a nutshell, uh, it affects routers and Internet of Things, checkmark, I said IoT. Uh, in, in fact, what it affects is embedded Linux systems with a BusyBox user land. So anything like we saw uh, IP cameras that are affected by that. Uh, we saw um, DVRs, uh, routers, but it's mostly routers. Uh, these things are, an, um, are, are uh, clearly targeted. It has a worm-like behavior. Works, it spreads through Telnet uh, credential brute force, which is uh, like everyone knows about that now because of Mirai botnet and stuff like that. Uh, its payload, its main payload, so it has several characteristics, but its main use is for a SOX uh, v4, v5, and HTTP, HTTPS proxy service. Um, it's really, really the, the core piece, uh, as we've seen it deployed in Honeypots, that is why it's existing. And it's used to proxy traffic to social media sites, which was kind of the thing we found odd, so after a long time of reverse engineering it, when we launched it into Honeypots uh, to, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, we were like, wow, wh why is it uh, everything is going uh, to social media sites? And also, a lot of the traffic was uh, HTTPS, and so uh, it prevented us from really understanding what was going on here. All the gory details have already been released, so anyone curious about the technical details can go to the, uh, the ESET paper or the past presentations. So at BotConf last year, we were at uh, this this point. So you see here is uh, the screenshot of Wireshark. So we knew it was social media traffic because of the CN of certificates. Um, and also we had some requests that were in clear text, uh, like this Instagram re request. We can see in number two that it's upgraded to HTTPS, so we actually only could gather a few usernames and not the actual modus operandi. So for uh, spam detection purposes, uh, fraud detection was not that useful. Uh, in number one, we see the, the, the overhead of the SOX v4 uh, protocol. So, and we, what we said last year was, good job, malware operator. We had this talk with the Fallout guy saying good job and bad job. Uh, we said, good job, malware operator. You, uh, most of your stuff is HTTPS, so we can't actually analyze what's going on. 
And um, so, yeah, we decided, uh, how about uh, we uh, attack it? And this is the, the, the results that we are sharing today. Understanding the botnet in a larger context uh, to have an understanding of the market they are in. Because in our, in our mind, you know, the social media likes and follows and, and selling it is not new. But the fact that the botnet is doing it was new. And the fact that it's an undocumented uh, market we, where we had no idea of the pricing and why the incentive to the criminals uh, was worth uh, sharing. So in order to catch Linux Moose version 2, we um, built a honeypot. We decided to go software-based instead of hardware because uh, it was more flexible and we could deploy it worldwide. Uh, we have deployed it in um, Russia, Singapore, Brazil, several places in the world. We kind of expected traffic to be different based on the country, which didn't happen. Uh, we decided to go low interaction so that we could uh, let it go, you know, without uh, monitoring. Um, and uh, we decided to sideload an ARM virtual machine in order to, instead of running a fake client, we could run the real uh, malware. Uh, so the architecture looks like this. Uh, we have on the left hand side the infected host. So it's a QMU system, an ARM Linux, the Debian uh, ORL images, and we deployed Linux Moose on it. We uh, put a man in the middle proxy process in front. Uh, we had on the right hand side the Kauri honeypot where we use we emulated the router user land uh, so the commands and the output of proc and stuff like that we had a busybox emulated and we enabled the telnet service on it uh, we use IP tables to route the traffic accordingly to what we our intent was and of course we did the full packet capture meanwhile so we chose Kauri because it was it's written in Python uh, it, so it's easy to modify it's uh, easy to emulate a file system. Uh, you can actually, you know, untar, uh, uh, bin, uh, bin walk a uh, uh, router firmware, and then have uh, extract the file system, and you have a tool in Kauri that can emulate the whole file system in one command, which is pretty cool. And command output, it's actively maintained. The only problem was there was no telnet support for it. But since we're programmers, uh, we figured we can do it. So we contributed telnet support to the Kauri on iPod project uh, last year, in the last year. Uh, at first, uh, we were kind of afraid that he will merge it, but in August, he actually merged it in the, to the upstream, upstream project. So we're proud to say that GoSecure implemented the Telnet support in Kauri, and now I think it's a really valuable honeypot to study the future of the IoT or the DDoS botnet. So attacking Linux Moose, uh, we uh, wanted to uh, take a look at the traffic. This is where our attack is. Uh, so we decided to go and... Um, understand uh, the, the traffic more than by the certificate name, more than by the CN, uh, because it limited what we could study. At first, we tried to do SSL strip on the Instagram traffic because it, we had the opportunity to do so, because it was in, in plain text at first, but this failed due to a redirection loop. They were always upgrading us to HTTPS, which meant that we weren't able to actually gather uh, plain text traffic. So what we did instead is we figured We'll go full on man in the middle and expect and hope that they wouldn't uh, detect us based on certificate errors. So uh, in a nutshell, I'll explain quickly and visually uh, what we did. So this is a, the normal operation of a proxy, of a SOX v4 proxy which, with HTTPS traffic. As you can see in purple, it's the HTTPS link. It's end-to-end, -end, so it's encrypted and authenticated. So our attack is we introduced um, a component uh, where we, using IP tables rules, rerouted the traffic to a, pro uh, a process. And that process terminated the HTTPS connection. And we have to craft our own certificate authorities, meaning that the operators of the botnet would see certificate errors. But we figured that we, you know, why not try it and see like, if they actually validate it. And the, the thing is, the internet is so wild and there's so much stuff out there that we figured that they probably had a lot of errors and they just disabled checking. And I'm uh, proud to say that we were lucky enough that it worked. Uh, so uh, we needed to do a few hacks to avoid trapping the CNC traffic because the protocol is HTTP based. So this required um, kind of a little trick. Uh, and we crossed our fingers. But we you know, uh, decided to still uh, kind of uh, help our, our luck here. So what we did is a bit of social engineering in the certificate authority. So it's really small, but uh, the, the goal of this slide is to show you that we, uh, for a certificate authority, decided to go with a security appliance certificate authority. So to mimic something that the botnet operators might have seen in the wild. 
since uh, we're lucky enough that the, the wireless is provided by Fortinet, and luckily uh, the screenshot is about a FortiGuard appliance, so we emulated a Fortinet a security product, thinking that the operators will be fooled by that. And um, at first, it failed. We used the uh, better cap first, uh, and um, we had problems with HSTS bypass. Uh, it, the, it's a feature built in into better cap that you can't disable. It uses a DNS trick uh, to do so, and because of uh, because in the SOX proxy you don't control the DNS, the DNS is done outside of your SOX proxy. It didn't work. We we had problems with that. Uh, we disabled it, so we patched. Uh, the HSTS bypass out of the code, we re rebuilt the gem, deployed it, but still we had problems where it would seg fault after a few days, and it we realized it generated no um, machine parsable logs, which is a problem when you want to monitor you know, 10, 20 uh, servers for over nine months. So we tried man in the middle proxy, and transparent proxy mode, it's been running for months, and it has a nice library to parse uh, logs. It's uh, all in Python, so it's pretty easy to use. Masara was able to analyze the data by herself. Like, uh, she learned Python programming, and uh, she was good. Uh, it was good, seriously. Very good tool. I recommend it for anyone, you know, attacking botnets and HTTPS traffic. Uh, so it was a success. Uh, they disregarded the certificate errors uh, generated by our fake certificate. And uh, so it was good. We had access to the social media traffic inside of the, the botnet. Okay. So, yeah, Sarah. So, where we're at now, right? We've got now several infected hosts actively used by operators. We've got HTTPS traffic in plain text. We've got CNC traffic. And while we were doing all that as well, we went into the seller's market and gathered a database with the prices and the quantities. So, we've got all that data and we need to analyze it. Um, so we sort of summarize our findings within five characteristics that sort of explain the whole scheme in which Linux Moose is involved in. Uh, we'll go through all of them one at once and then explain why we think uh, that sort of creates the scheme. So Olivier, you still have to go for... Uh... Yeah, I'm taking care of the first two pieces. So stealthy. Uh, we say it's stealthy. Uh, mainly because they're really trying to avoid attention. Uh, one thing they do is they have no x86 version. So I've been running, you know, uh, collectors of uh, and analyzing uh, samples around uh, embedded Linux systems for years. Most of the threats have an x86 version, like m most except Linux Moose. And so f for us, we think that this is to avoid collection and to avoid, you know, the, the easier or the, the the, the honeypots that are deployed without thinking about architecture-specific uh, features. And so this, for them, is a way to avoid reverse engineering or easy reverse engineering if you want to know the compiler for MIPS. Uh, and uh, I don't pay for the ARM version. Uh, <laughs> so uh, also, it does no ad fraud, DDoS, or spam. So nothing like obviously illegal or that Google is obviously against. So this is, an uh, again, you know, it's, it's doing something like that no one is interested in which is, you know, traffic, uh, likes and, fro and follows on, on Instagram. And it has no persistent mechanism. The lack of persistence uh, for us is explained by the fact that uh, we saw updates in the code where uh, they, they would change memory management. So we think that they crashed uh, routers uh, often. And um, so if your grandmother is infected and, her, and there is persistent and your router is crashing, you know, uh, every day, at some point she will get rid of it and buy a new one. So we think that they carefully avoided persistence in order to stay under the radar. So they, the router would crash, let's say, but then since it doesn't persist, it won't get reinfected until it is rescanned via telnet and you know, uh, weak credentials. So we think this is a way for them to you know, just move from host to host and just take the low-hanging fruit IoT devices that are there, and they probably need a, you know, a few thousand uh, host botnet, and it's enough for them. So we say constantly adapting because uh, after we released our, uh, the ESET paper, the, they, it took, they took a summer off and then they uh, updated uh, the malware to avoid the specific and low-hanging fruit I IOCs that we released. So going through these, um, the IP address used to be hard-coded inside the binary. Now it's passed as an argument, meaning that you need uh, to have an honeypot in order to have access to the, the argument. Otherwise, you, you won't have it only with the malware sample. But 
or if you only run a honeypot and you don't know how to reverse engineer, you will still have a problem because the, the, the IP address is packed as an integer and it's XORed with a static value inside the binary. So you actually need both the binary and um, the uh, honeypot system to be able to know the CNC. And the CNC was released in our, in our uh, latest paper, so if you want to go after it, you can, or help us do so. Uh, the proxy port change, this was really obvious, was the easiest snort rules and uh, easy mitigation for ISPs, so we kind of figured it would change. Uh, so the, the, here's the old port and the new one, 20, uh, 0, 12. The proxy service is only accessible from a specific list of IP, which we call a whitelist. And the, the, I'm pretty sure they call it also the whitelist because the parameter is WL. Uh, the whitelist is provided by the command and control server. Um, and this, the, the existence of a whitelist uh, uh, prevents us from scanning the internet on that port to have an idea of, of the botnet size. We would need to have access to one of these IP addresses, which we are trying to do, and then scan the whole internet, and then we would have the exact botnet footprint, which we would love to do, but unfortunately, no one's collaborating with a, with a shitty malware like that. With us tracking a shitty malware like that. They changed the bot uh, enrollment process. So now you actually need to infect uh, from an infected host in order to uh, receive proxy commands or uh, proxy traffic in the, at the victim side. So uh, they could do it because the CNC server is involved in an infection. It's uh, his who receives the, the, the proc uh, architecture of the CPU and then decide what binary to send to the victim. Uh, so the, the, what we did is we, uh, we use a debugger in order to throw an, an, a live infected host uh, at our uh, honeypot system. And this is why, how we've been able to successfully uh, receive command. This took us a little while. We kind of uh, haven't thought about it and our honeypots were not successful and then we kind of, you know, went uh, table rase and uh, we figured that we, uh, and we thought about that it could be the case. And then once we uh, started doing the debugging thing, it started to work. Our infection started to have better um, commands. Uh, they upgraded the protocol. So the, whole, the old protocol was HTTP, uh, but using binary data. So really easy, again, to fingerprint and really not normal traffic. As you can see, number one is the request and number two is the answer. The new protocol is uh, wrapping it in uh, real HTTP. So this is rather small, but you can see a request and a reply. So the way they're doing it is um, they, they are packing the, the old binary format inside an HTTP uh, cookie. So uh, the cookie field, so cookie for the client, set cookie for the server. Uh, and um, in, they even uh, use the default page of a web server, it works. Uh, as you can see in tree. So this means that at first when I found the, the, the CNC, I, I kind of didn't thought that it was the good one. I thought, oh, they probably cleaned that server because it's a default Apache page. But then after looking at the, the headers, I was like, oh, there are cookies and there shouldn't be cookies for stuff like that. So uh, yeah, they uh, do what we call bozo encoding. So they didn't use base64 to encode the binary data. They use a stupid custom um, thing that looks like that. So it was updated, so constantly adapting, but yet still the same, going after weak tenant credentials, credentials using bots uh, as proxy. And the whole idea is to have clean IP addresses so that they can go after social networks and have IP addresses that are DSL lines, cable lines, and you know consumer IP addresses. So this, I, I think, is what they, they leverage through this uh, IoT botnet. Uh, and also be m maybe more stable than if you infect a PC where you get detected and you, get, you, you draw more attention. And it still targets a uh, social network. And on that, Masara <laughs> is going to talk about what it's doing. Fun time. Okay, so we also know that social media fraud doesn't create any direct victims. What's social media fraud? We came up with that uh, definition that says the process of creating false endorsement of social networks accounts in order to enhance a user's popularity and visibility. And mostly it is just doing fake, like creating fake accounts, going onto social networks and, and making, like doing likes and follows. Through uh, Linux most traffic, what we could see in our honeypots is that most of the requests were sent towards Instagram. So our botnet was uh, focusing on that social network. 
at 86%. We had a bit of Twitter as well, but it was often flagged as spam really quickly. And a bit of Periscope, Flippergram, and Kiwi, which is, I don't know if you know those social networks, they're not really well known. But we'll talk a bit more about them later. We focused on the Instagram uh, social network just because it's 86% of the traffic, right? And uh, we look at what it does on Instagram. And what we found is that most of its activities is a walkthrough to either perform a follow or a like. So what we found is that 13% of the requests are actually billing things, like things that the botnet can bill. And the rest is just tr the botnet trying to uh, look human. So we found various modus operandi, we say, uh, that, the that the operators would sort of try to look like a human. What we found is, for example, sorry, he would go and uh, it's in its logging its fake account, sorry, and then go in its inbox and then go and see potential recipients. It would go in on its personal timeline and do all those requests. So it would then create a following without being flagged as a spam by Instagram. Because if it was only, it's quite obvious, if it was only doing following, then he would be like flagged right away. But what we find is that's really successful, right? Because in 89% of the cases, uh, Linux Moose actually uh, could do a follow successfully without being flagged as spam by Instagram. In 11% of the cases, we found that Instagram was actually flagging, saying, you're a spam, you're a bot. If you are not, please contact us. And we have no idea how we, they actually sort of managed to flag 11% of them. But you know what? What's interesting about that is that follows don't last. So Linux Moose puts, puts a lot of emphasis into doing those follows that are actually uh, not flagged, but it doesn't put any efforts into the botnet accounts, uh, sorry, not the botnet, the fake accounts. So what it does is, um, what we found is that most of the fake accounts were looking like robots. So they had like fake pictures, uh, not fake pictures, but uh, buildings, uh, plans, or really sort of boring pictures, and it had no followers, and it was following lots of people, no descriptions. And through our six months analysis, we found that 72% of our fake accounts that went through our honeypots were suspended by Instagram. And what does this mean, right? Because it means that buyers are getting ripped off because they're buying their follows and they're getting them, but within six months, they're gonna lose them all and they'll have to buy again. But talking about the buyers, who are they, right? Who are those people that are actually feeding uh, and feeding the botnet? Well, what we did is through the traffic, we could determine a potential buyers by going into uh, looking at the traffic and going into the follows, the profiles on which the follows were performed by Linux Moves. So we took all active profiles that were either business or individuals uh, that had lots of followers by the time the follow was created and no reaction in the pictures that were posted. So for example, if you've got 150,000 followers, but you post the pictures and 26 people react, then it probably means that a great percentage of your followers are fake. So we sort of determine uh, three big categories that are overlapping, just showing who are the buyers and who are the, um, those buying social media fraud. The first uh, category is business-related accounts. Here we've got a, an electronic cigarette shop with uh, 17,000 followers. It's actually, like we blurred it for ethical reason, but you could actually go into the websites and then go and buy electronic cigarettes. I'm not sure they're gonna be shipped to you, but still. So we found lots of business-related accounts that were either online, so solely online and maybe a scam, and some of them as well that were in like small businesses that don't have money to actually buy uh, large marketing uh, departments. So, for example, the pizza shop, pizza shop in Kuwait or a restaurant in, uh, in Brazil. We also found lots of business-related accounts, but that were centered around the individual, and we're going to build towards the ego market here, right? So, here we've got an example of a guy who's got a million followers, and he is a web designer looking for projects, luxurious only. And uh, what, what is funny is that it just links to its website and to the fact that he's doing that, but most of his profile pictures are just focused on him and his wealth, right? So we've got a guy on a boat, a guy smoking shisha with his Mac, with his nice car, his cute dogs and his watches. So, and we found lots of them, like lots of tattooists, photographers, anything that could sort of be a business, but uh, centered, could be centered around an individual. And finally, we found lots of uh, aspiring celebrities. So anything, blogger, anything that, anything, anyone that could actually uh, wanna have more business by being popular 
for their own, uh, what they're doing. So we've got singers, bloggers, uh, and the like. So those are sort of the three large categories. We found as well lots of that, which I had to blur lots of it because it's mostly uh, skin, yeah. <laughs> So those are people that actually, they buy social media fraud, but they're not business, they don't do it for themselves. Well, they may be business, because there's like some bodybuilders here, but in the end, you don't really know. It's, yeah, my favorite was always the one here with a um, million followers as well, which is like chilling out with his Mac in the water or with his Kalashnikov in a girl, you're always like, are you really popular, good. So yeah. So is this an ego market? Like we came out with that name and uh, well, that's pretty much what we saw from the buyers. Here we've put two pictures. One of Selena Gomez taking a picture of herself with this guy being really mad. And then there's our Canadian prime minister here who's really known for taking pictures of himself all the time. So just to come back, no direct victims. Well, social media fraud doesn't create any direct victims just like ransomware, right? The only victims that we could find was, were those that get fooled by the false popularity. So advertisement companies that actually uh, buy, like, pay those people to advertise for them, but they're not going to have the visibility that they actually paid for, but who really cares? And uh, <laughs> the people are, sorry, the botnet master or the people behind that, they're making criminal money by having a botnet, but they're actually selling to common people the service that they're providing, right? So they're, they're charging legitimate card, credit cards, and they're probably doing their tax returns just saying that they're doing social marketing, right? Who wouldn't believe that you say, I'm doing social media marketing, and if you don't get audited, then you're fine. Mm -hmm. um, so next characteristics, uh, hiding in plain sights. That's because we went through the seller's market, and probably everyone sort of knew that you could buy fake followers online on really ex easily accessible websites, like this one here. We found, like, have hundreds of thousands of websites and social media fraud being sold on all sorts of social networks from Twitter, Facebook, Google+, etc. And what's interesting is that it's easily, access easily accessible through search engines, so it's like looking at the buyers, you would expect that you could easily go through Google and just buy that, right? <laughs> and then here's, we wanted to give you an example of the price bundles, so for example here you get from 100 followers to 50,000 followers and if you want to buy 5,000, and then it's $40. And with the database that we created, at first we didn't know that Linux Moose was focusing most solely on Instagram. So we sort of built that, and we could just give you an overview of the prices and know that Instagram is cheaper and LinkedIn is much, uh, much more expensive. And you've got Facebook in the middle. What's interesting about the prices is that uh, for all of them, what we found is it's really very, like there's a lot of variation. So if you, you could buy 10,000 followers for $2 or you could buy 10,000 followers for $2,000, right? And usually in economics, we say that if the prices are really, really close to each other, it's because it's really competitive if everyone's trying to like grab the market. But here what we see is probably not that it's not competitive, much more than it's probably an immature market. So people don't know the worth of their service. So they're either overpricing or undercharging. And buyers don't know exactly what's the worth of it either. So what they do is they just try to gauge which one they could buy and they're not gonna be less ripped off, right? So here's a little story. Because we've been through all those websites and gathered data uh, on the prices and the quantities, but we really wanted to find that website that was actually selling Linux Moose service, right? So we could find the, the end where the prices were. So we found a seller that sells, that sold Periscope, Flippergram, and Kiwi uh, social network services, which if you don't know, Periscope is a live streaming social network. Flippergram is videos and Kiwi is asking questions. And he sold as well Instagram. So I went to CLDV and I was like, mm, that could actually be uh, our seller, it could be Linux Moose. So we created a fake account and we decided to buy fake followers from them and see if those, like if the fake account we created could actually go through our traffic and our honeypots. That would confirm that that's actually related to Linux Moose, right? So I created a fake account called Beautiful Bird and yeah, and about 6,000 followers. And you can see that they were provided uh, throughout the weekend. But then, just like the day afterwards, I lost lots of them. And that was a good opportunity for me to contact them, right? Because it was related to an email address. So I contacted them first, saying, hey, about 6,000 followers from your website last week. And at that time, I had lost 500 followers, but 
I lost more during the day. So I asked, can you provide them to me again? And I started a little story about a contest in winter photography. And he replied really quickly, sure, adding. And as you can see, I got 8,000 followers, so everything was fine. My fake account was really, really, really popular, right? Which is good. But then I lost again 1,100 followers if, like a few days afterwards. So I wrote to him again, because we wanted to see if my profile would end up in the traffic. So as soon as I lose them, I would write to him, like, push me up again. So he replied, I'm adding. Well, followers are not forever, but I'm adding them when you ask for. Really bad English written, but still. Uh, so I was like, fair enough. Every time I, I, like, I'm losing followers, I can actually ask you more, and my probability that if it's the good person will see it. And then I lost so many followers, no replies. Lost so many followers, no replies. So I, he ended up just stopping uh, replying to me. And now my fake account has 1,100 followers, and those are my pictures, and no one reacts to them, so. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me really sad. But it ended up in our traffic. So we actually found that there's not a lot of research that starts from a malware binary and can actually find from where the service is sold, is sold and what are the prices. It ended up in the, we were about 86%, 80, 80 sure that that's actually related to Linux moves. So yeah. And the last characteristic that we wanted to talk about is large potential profitability. And that's because we had the prices. We knew how many follows the botnet performed on average, right? So what we did is we took an average, sorry, we took our honeypots and looked at the number of follows that were performed per month on Instagram. And then we took an average of the prices and uh, try to estimate how much every bot would make per month, right? So if all follows were monetized only on Instagram, Linux Moose would make $13 per month per bot on average, which is a lot, thinking that Renting our servers just to run the honeypots cost us $10, so that's $3 profit here. But, yeah, but in the end, uh, you need to f like monetize all your follows. So what we did here is just for fun, like looking at the potential revenue of Linux moves according to the number of bots that would actually uh, exist. Sorry. So you look, if you look at it, you, you see that there's a large potential revenue. If Linux moves had 3,000 uh, but he could actually make $400,000 per month, which is a lot. Okay, let's say we know that all follows are not monetized, right? Because we saw that he actually gave me more while I was complaining. So let's say he does, like, he monetizes half of it. Then we see that with 30,000 uh, butts, he could actually make, on average, $200,000, which is still quite a lot. So what we can come up from that, mostly, because we don't know uh, how many butts Linux Moose has, is that it's actually sitting on a pot of gold. But there's the questions of how many follow, like follows are monetized, but there's also the question of how many administrators there's behind Linux Moose, because that we don't know either. What we know so far, and we're gonna continue our research, is we know that there's seven IP addresses that Olivier mentioned that actually you can push requests through the bots. So we know as well that looking at the profile, some of them had descriptions and three languages were used mostly Dutch, English, and Spanish. And we uh, found, so far, related to that email address, seven web, web interfaces. So we'll continue our research, because we're probably thinking that he's within a reseller model, so having like, lots of uh, web interfaces where they're actually like, pushing him, saying, oh, like, put more followers on that profile, and he's just doing it. So yeah, that's pretty much what we found about Linux Moose. We know that it's stealthy because it has no x86 variants and it's running on embedded system. We know it's constantly adapting because we've seen from the ESET research report that it actually changed lots of features. We know that what it does doesn't create any direct victims and it's so peculiar that uh, we can, like no law enforcement agents wants to uh, take down the botnet or take time for that. We know it's hiding in plain sight because it's selling services not on underground forums but on clear web just to an easily search, uh, search engine. And we know as well that it has a large potential profitability just because there's lots of money to make from having a botnet and creating fake follows. So that in the end sort of made us think that Linux Moose is sort of involved in a really clever scheme that is sort of a criminal interstice where he's running a botnet but not attracting any attention and not, not actually, well, well, 
we're actually wondering because we would like to find the guy or those people and see if they're actually like running and sorry driving BMWs and living in really big houses and stuff like that to see if that's really possible. So it sort of made us think that that's most, it's, it could be sort of a perfect internet crime where you are involved in botnet but making lots of money without attention. Which is, it's cool, it's a cool conclusion except that we had to go through all this for like six months. And that made me, <laughs> while I was working and clients were coming in and they could see my computer, I was like, yeah, that's the research, that's research. And it's, it's so perfect, Linux Most is so perfect that Throughout those six months, we could not raise any interest from law enforcement or hosting providers. And we're sort of calling out today, uh, asking if anyone would be interested into collaborating with us so we could actually attack the CNC server and ask us how many do sync holding and ask us how many bots are actually owned or infected by Linux Moose. And we lost a bit faith in humanity because uh, yeah, ego market doesn't make you believe in humanity anymore. Until we saw this, right? That's profile of dogs with more money than you. If you want to hate them, but they're just so damn cute, so. Well, so that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, if you've got any questions, please come. We have IOCs uh, for the threat online on, uh, on the ESETS GitHub page. Also, and uh, the uh, paper and blog, and the paper will be released with the BotConf uh, papers. Questions? Uh, hi. Did you also try to contact uh, the social media uh, websites themselves if they wanted to take any action? We did um, uh, a year and a half ago, so not for the version 2, in version 1 we did, and we got absolutely no response, like they, they, they didn't, but okay, so I didn't have any unencrypted traffic, I only had encrypted traffic, so, so yeah, absolutely nothing was going on uh, from them, and for this, uh, this time around, um, I guess we ran out of time or I was jaded and I didn't want to get in touch, but at this point now that we've, you know, released the research and I'm less worried about burning my honeypot IP addresses, we can then... So yeah, I have a ton of PCAP and a ton of clear text logs to share if anyone's interested, uh, Facebook, Instagram. Thank you. Oh, and just want to say as well, like, with them having more followers and more fake accounts just makes them having more. Is it? Oh, sorry. So, for example, if uh, like Instagram lately just said, oh, we've got 500 million people and do, like we're the largest social networks and that's really good for their stakes. So, yeah. I have a question. Uh, you know why uh, the, an account of LinkedIn is more expensive than Instagram or Facebook? Well, I've got a hypothesis. Like, yeah. I think Instagram is probably, uh, it's easier for the botnet to actually create fake accounts on Instagram. I think there may be more demand as well. Uh, no, sorry, more, more supply. And I think LinkedIn is, uh, yeah, like I'm not on LinkedIn, unfortunately, so far yet. But, <laughs> but I know that uh, getting followers must be hard because they're actually clustering people and you can't have like having 500,000 followers is probably it's a structure of a uh, social network. Yeah, I uh, think so. And the probably team of, uh, of Defear to take down bad accounts, I think. LinkedIn also leads you to a job, you know, so maybe, you know, you pay for it because you see that you make money eventually. Yeah. Thank you. Just to follow up, what? was asked before about contacting the social media providers. I, I did some part-time research a few years ago into fake Twitter accounts, and Twitter was actually interested in that. But also, if you have, in, in this case, with Twitter, if I had a, a few accounts, then I could, just from looking at the Twitter profiles, I could, could analyze and, and find similar accounts. So maybe Instagram, if they had your, this 1,000 accounts that are fake, from, from their uh, vantage point, they could probably see accounts that are similar uh, so similar behavior and they might be able to take down hundreds of thousands of accounts 
may be created by by different botnets or or different ways. So so I I am more positive that they are that they do probably care to some extent, especially if you if you give them like here's a list of thousand accounts uh, and maybe you can find similar ones. So uh, we think they actually do a good job of that because as uh, she shared, 72% uh, of the account were eventually flagged as spam. So, but we think they operate in sweeps. So they actually probably have some, let's say the buzzword, uh, machine learning. And uh, they, they figure out uh, clusters of accounts that are related. And then they maybe look and do timeline analysis and stuff. But they actually are pretty successful. And we, maybe I don't think that our traffic will be that valu valuable. But as I said, at this point, I guess I should get in touch, and I'm just being rude of not doing it. So yeah, good point, Martin. And any more questions? Four, one, two. Ah, over there. I'm, I'm wondering why, why you had to set up a man-in-the-middle HTTPS uh, instead of hooking the processes in order to get uh, an encrypted uh, traffic. So because it's a proxy, there, there's no way to have the actual HTTP. It's not a browser right. in, the, in the malware. It's just traffic is going through it. So there's no way of having it in clear text. OK, thanks. Last question. The, the, the proxy architecture is actually very nice because it means that the malware sample is really simple. It's like one C function that performs the, the SOX proxying. And so the, the, the intelligent or the, like when you look only at the malware sample, you don't, you don't understand the intent of the operation. You actually need honeypots and, you know, to gather the stuff. So the, I think a lot of the crimeware is putting less and less intent in the binary files. And I think this is, you know, the, the criminals that are adapting. We, uh, we think this, this uh, botnet is a lot about adaptation, you know, staying under the radar, moving to a new legitimate criminal model where they can, you know, charge legitimate credit cards. So it's really interesting to see how they, um, they keep being a step ahead, you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>